All right, I've got a little bit to get through tonight. This is the last last study on Revelation we're going to do. We've made it to the end. <laughs> next week we'll ne- next uh, next week we'll have a bit of a summary discussion, all that before we dive into another book. But uh, we started the last chapter last week. And we talked about uh, Yahushua coming back, remember? And this is the last part of it. So let's start at the beginning of the chapter just to revise. And let's dive into it. Revelation chapter 22. I am coming soon. And you'll remember some of this stuff from last week. Then the angel showed me the river of living water, clear as crystal that flows from the throne of Yahusha, the Lamb. This river flows down the middle of the street of the city and the tree of life is on each side of the river, producing fruit every month, 12 times a year. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nation. We discussed all that, remember? We won't need any healing, will we? We'll be perfect, but it represented continual reliance and feeding on Yahusha. So, and of course, the tree of life we discussed also at the end of last session was we can start tasting that now, the tree of life, the river of life. He's the tree and his word and his healing is the river from it. And we're experiencing that. Let's go on. Nothing that Yahushua curses or judges guilty will be there in that city. Nothing. For the throne of Yahushua, the lamb will be in there and his servants will serve and worship him. Most other translations say the throne of Yahuwah and the Lamb, but we know who they are, don't we? It's Yahusha, he's the Lamb. There's one throne. This curse that Yahusha put upon mankind, what is it? It's that sin causes death. The Torah itself, especially the part that's law, is based upon the existence of this curse. And that is why the death penalty for certain crimes against the law was established. This principle was made famous with the erecting of the two standing stones in Canaan almost immediately after Joshua led the 12 tribes across the Jordan River. One of the stones listed the blessings and the other stone listed the curses of the law. So you could do one or the other and there'll be consequences for either one, good or bad. So to a Jew in John's day, it would be important to have it made clear that the curse of the law, death, is no longer in effect on the new earth. Don't need to be. So the leaves of the tree of life that give eternal life also serve to represent the end of the curse that had brought eternal death. It's not even relevant in this new kingdom, new reign, new heaven and earth. This was also interesting. This verse is another indication that heaven and earth have melded together, new heaven, new earth, have melded together in some inexplicable way because the mention of heaven as a separate place from earth, heaven's always a separate place from earth all through the scripture, isn't it? But here, the mention of heaven and earth as separate places is no longer here. And that fact has always been front and centre since the beginning of Revelation. And actually since after Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden. They've always been separate. Now, they're together. Yahushua's home had always been heaven, but now it's a new earth, dwelling among transformed first fruit humans and also the heavenly creatures, if you can say the word human, first fruit, first fruit creatures. We won't be human, but we will be, but we won't be. First fruit creations, there's no such thing like us except Yahushua. He was the first. So let's go on. His servants, the bride, will see his face. Now that's significant when you look through all the scripture, people who wanted to see his face will see his face. His name will be written on their foreheads. There will never be night again. People won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For Yahushua, the only living Elohim, will give them light. And they will rule like kings forever and ever in his light. 
Another reference to the name written on our foreheads again, alluding back to the old scriptures. Yahushua's servants will wear his name on their foreheads. This is a direct connection to the high priest who wore the name of Yahuwah on his head band, his headband. We are bought with a price and Yahushua owns us and has rested his perfect name upon us. I wanted to put pictures of Yellowstone in there, but I didn't bother. The branding. You, we own you. Mm-hmm. Try and leave. And I, have, I found another one that said, I'll take you to the train station. <laughs> if you try and leave, you know. So I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just say it. So we won't distract from the point. But see the point? We're owned. He's branded us. We, we are his. Night will no longer exist. There's no night. And this speaks about never-ending light because we're told that neither the light of a lamp, whether it be artificial light, or the sun, natural light, will be needed. Then we're told that Yahushua's servants will reign as kings, which makes perfect sense because Yahushua promised that his followers would reign along with him, some even on thrones. So, then the angel said to me, Remember John's getting all this from an angel? Could be Yahusha. So then the angel said to me, These words are true and can be trusted. For Yahusha, unless Yahusha is speaking in the first person, it's an angel. These words are true and can be trusted. For Yahusha, the mighty Elohim of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must happen soon. So listen, I'm coming very soon. Listen, I'm coming very soon. He's still saying that now. I'm coming very soon. And there'll be huge blessings for anyone who obeys the living words of prophecy written in this book. This is essentially the conclusion. This is the conclusion of all that bit there that we just read. That's actually the end of his visions and his prophecies. The rest of the book is just John summarising. This is essentially the conclusion of all John's visions because the last short section isn't technically a vision but John's final thoughts about what he's just seen and experienced which is still Yahushua's words given to John and us by divine inspiration but it's just not a trancy vision like the rest of it. But what does happen now is a sense of urgency. That's what we're going to see kick into the book now. A sense of urgency and a call to be mature, to be perfected and set apart. And it is made by repeating the same essential message over and over. And that urgency revolves around the timing and certainty. Certainty, not a what if, a certainty. Timing and certainty of Yahushua making his long-awaited return. You can see that four times he says it. In this chapter 22... He says it four times. In verse 7, he says, uh, look, I'm coming very soon. Verse 10, he says, the fulfillment of the Revelation's prophecies is near. The fulfillment is near. In other words, I'm coming soon. Verse 12, he says, pay attention. I'm coming real soon. And verse 20, he says, yes, I'm coming soon. Do you think he wants us to know something? He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He wants us to know that. And this was 2,000 years ago. And in case, I think I mentioned this when we first started Revelation, but John and the apostles, they thought they were living in the last days. They thought they were living in the last days because of how hideous Rome was and all the things Yahushua told them, Matthew 24, all that stuff. They thought, oh, we can hang out. Yeah, we can wait. We can trust. They thought that was the end. They were going to see him come back themselves. They didn't know there's going to be another 2,000 odd years. So why this repetitious warning? Why this repetitious warning of his imminent return to end this book? Why? Because at the moment of Yahushua's return, Revelation tells us that the spiritual condition and therefore the eternal future of each and every human being that is living or has ever lived will be frozen forever, forever frozen. The minute he comes back, it's frozen This means that when the trumpet sounds and Yahushua blasts through the invisible seam of dimensions for the whole earth to see, it does not signal a final call to repentance or opportunity to make a fresh decision because you've seen something. No, 
Rather, it means the time for decision and change has come and gone permanently. This is the context in which we must understand. This is the context we must understand the final few precious words of the scripture. He wants us to believe it now. His word now. He'll reward those who believe. What did he say to Thomas? Blessed are you if you believe without seeing. You believe. So when you see him come, oh, you arrive. Oh, look, such and such was right. He's come back. He's real. He's real. Too late. He's come back. Revelation 1, remember, said, Blessed are the reader, blessed are the reader and hearer of the words of this prophecy, provided they obey the things written in it. For the time is near. That's how we started Revelation. And now we're going to end it with, Listen, I'm coming very soon. And there'll be huge blessings for anyone who obeys the living words of prophecy written in this book. So, the beginning and the ending of Revelation are tied together in a neat bundle with those two verses behaving as bookends. I'm coming soon. Yahushua does something very unusual in it. He gives us a glimpse of not only the historical future, but also of the eternal future after the end of history. He sets out requirements for us to participate, for us to participate in the new earth, new universe eternal millennial kingdom, but also the things that disqualify us also. Yet some of those disqualifiers are no longer politically or socially popular to utter these days. And so societies and even some bridal fellowships have often sought to find ways to dilute the requirements, to dilute the instructions, or dismiss them altogether as primitive, irrelevant, or even hateful. But what Yahushua calls evil and an abomination and wrong will always be that way, no matter what the world declares or the pressure they apply. Whether they believe it or not, like we were discussing last the last session, it's true. It's a universal principle. Yahushua's put it out there. Whether you believe it or not, it still stands and there'll be consequences. So now John's going to uh, wrap up this whole book. Hello there. <laughs> I'm John, the one who heard and saw these things. And after I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. How about this? He fell down to worship at the angel. But the angel said to me, Oi, come on now. You can't worship me. I'm just a servant like you and your brothers, the prophets, and like all those who guard and obey the living words in this book. Now worship Yahushua, not me. The angel says that he is among the fellow servants, just like the prophets and the people who obey the words of this book. He is speaking of the old blood covenant prophets from whom John drew so much of his wording and the structure of his book of Revelation. Those who were also shown or told much of what John was shown, receiving a similar message centuries earlier. We saw them, Zechariah, there was Ezekiel, there was Daniel, all these guys that received it but didn't get it in the fullness that John got it in. So when it comes to worship, there is a universal two-class system in place. The one to be worshipped, which is Yahushua, and everyone and everything else as the worshippers. It's only two. So the angels just told him, don't, don't bow down and worship me. I'm just your brother. I'm just a servant. Worship Yahushua. Then the angel told me, don't seal up the words of, Remember, remember this, this is important. Don't seal up the words of prophecy in this book or keep it a secret. Don't keep it a secret. For the time is near for all these things to happen. John is instructed to do something that has a familiar ring to it. However, the instruction is, is the opposite of what an earlier prophet was told to do. And we're going to go into this when we study Daniel. Daniel was given a huge portion of what John was given as well. But look what, Je look what Daniel was told. But you, Daniel, keep these words secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rush here and there as knowledge increases. So Daniel was told, and Daniel actually wanted to know what was, he was fibergasted, upset, felt sick. He wanted to know what the end of the story was. And you just said, no, that's enough. Pens down, not allowed to know. Seal it up. And so he was a bit upset by that. But John, 
is told, don't seal it up. I've just given you the whole ending and everything. Daniel and the continuation of it, don't seal it up. So while Daniel was told to keep the visions of the future a secret, John was told to publish what he received. Why could John reveal what... Why could John reveal what Daniel had to conceal? Why? Because knowledge must increase first. Knowledge of what? Knowledge by whom? We've discussed on numerous occasions that not only revelation, but also the words of the old blood covenant prophets in past times were often not understood or they were outright misunderstood until the passage of time and enough history unfolded so that the circumstances surrounding the prophesied events became imaginable or even apparent. They had to wait some time until they understood the prophecies. They didn't understand them straight away. John had substantially more knowledge and understanding than Daniel because John lived around 700 years after Daniel. For instance, while for Daniel, deliverance was little more than the Jewish people being rescued, from their Babylonian captivity and returning in freedom to their homeland. That was but a shadow of what was coming. That was all Daniel thought deliverance would be. We're, we're being slaves in Babylon. We'll be delivered. That's deliverance to Daniel. But John came to understand deliverance on an entirely different level. Remember, this John is the disciple, the student that Yahushua loved, wrote the book of John, the gospel, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Now he's writing Revelation. So he's come to understand deliverance on an entirely different level. And that is the supernatural. No longer was deliverance only a liberation from an earthly oppressor. It had become a spiritual reality of far more impact. Because it crosses all cultural boundaries and transcends all eras and language, this deliverance. Even the one who performed the delivering act, Yahushua Messiah, was known to John, walked around with him. Daniel was given a brief insight into several distant end time events, but he could make little sense of them because they were utterly bizarre to his mind. In fact, they confused and upset him so terribly that we read, I, Daniel, grew weak and was ill for some days. Then I got up, took care of the king's affairs, but I was appalled and upset at the vision and still couldn't understand it. Because remember the vision, there's beasts with different heads and crowns and you know, four beasts here and there. He didn't understand it at all. It's bizarre. But John understood a lot of his visions, for many were a re replay of Daniel's. But not all of them. He received a better understanding of the sequence of future events and to an extent when they would occur. John had the benefit of Daniel's, Ezekiel's, Isaiah's, and all the other old prophets' writings. Still, most of the visions were to take place so far in the future from John's time, as we are now privileged to know, that there was no way that he could possibly understand the features, the shapes, the objects, and human institutions that he was being shown. Imagine if he wouldn't have been able to see the 21st century. He wouldn't, he'd be baffled. But rather than being confused to the point of illness, as with Daniel, John was awed and overwhelmed to the point of wrongly worshipping the angel that spoke much of it to him. As you would if you were that overwhelmed, you just bow down and be overwhelmed. So let's get on with it. The angel has just told him, don't seal up the book. Don't seal it up. So anyone who's doing evil... Keep doing evil. Let anyone who's unclean and filthy stay that way. Let anyone who's being obedient keep being obedient. And let anyone who's set apart be even more set apart. That scripture there has baffled people for ages. That one about how Yahushua feels about the state of mankind. In that, uh, well, if you're going to be a certain way, you, you can't change. You stay that way. Let's look at it. Our loving and long-suffering master can also be severe. Essentially, the words seem to say, whatever you are, you're destined to stay that way. Let's look at Daniel 12 and Ecclesiastes 11. Many will purify 
cleanse and refine themselves. But the wicked will keep on acting wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand. But those with discernment will understand. It reminds me of the scripture where it says uh, there are some people who are just born on this earth to do evil. It's the only reason they're born. The wicked will just keep doing wicked. Ecclesiastes 11, as a tree falls, so it lies. And as a man lives, so he dies. Character and destiny. Destiny is in where you're going to end up. Character is in who you are. Character and destiny are both settled here in time. What a person is and what a person does in life determine what they are eternally. Behaviour matters. And this is a worldly poem, but it was I liked it. This man-made poem is true. If you sow a thought, sow a thought, you reap a behaviour. If you and do that enough times, you sow a behaviour, you start reaping a habit. It becomes a habit. You do it all the time. If you sow a habit long enough, you reap a character. That's who you are. People know that's who you are by your habits. And if you sow a character, you reap a destiny. What do you think of that? Interesting. So it all starts from a thought. Isn't that why we have to check our thoughts? Your thoughts can control where you end up. The scripture states what the wicked do versus what the righteous do. And since the wicked will go on behaving wickedly, they will not understand either the goodness of Yahushua or the meaning of the events of the end times as they begin to happen. But the righteous bride will further purify, further cleanse and further refine themselves as a result receive discernment so that they do understand the goodness of Yahushua and also the meaning of the events of the end times as, the, as they unfold. So it's not just talking about the sinners up here. It says, anyone who's doing evil, keep doing evil. Let anyone who's unclean and filthy stay that way. You want to be that? Stay that way. Anyone who's being obedient, though, keep being obedient. And let anyone who's set apart be even more set apart. So he's talking to two different groups of people, isn't he? Listen. I'm coming soon, and I'll bring rewards with me. This is his word. We've got to believe this. We've got to believe this. He's coming soon, and he's bringing rewards. Don't think I won't repay everyone for what they've done, good and evil. I am the Aleph and the Tor, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's secret code for I am the creator. I started this, and I'll finish it. I am the Aleph and the Tor, the first and the last, beginning and the end. There'll be huge blessings for anyone who's washed their robes by actively behaving my words. That's what washing your robes in him is, to actively behave his words. And they'll have the right to eat right from the tree of life. And as we know, that's Yahushua. They can go through the gates into the eternal city, but... Outside those city gates are all those dogs who enchant with drugs, who whore, who murder, worship idols, and who love to lie and be fake. So, outside those city gates are all those dogs. Dogs. Does Yahushua have something against dogs? In ancient Hebrew times, dogs... Were, what are the chances of finding a picture of a dog sitting on a blanket that says Yahushua? What are the chances? I found one. In ancient Hebrew times, dogs were held in contempt as being filthy and without worth. They were not pets and in Jewish ritual were unclean, shameless and without any redeeming virtues. So as you can imagine, the term dog was used as a nasty insult hurled towards an enemy. It was the customary term used throughout, throughout the scripture for a male temple prostitute. So when speaking of dogs figuratively, it was in most cases, though not all, speaking of what today we'd call LGBTQI. 
which is a likely case here given the context as a behavioural lifestyle that was excluded from eternal life with Yahushua. Does that make sense? There's plenty of uh, references here. The dogs also speak of the, un, uh, speak of the circumcision. I thought that was interesting because circumcision refers to Jews. Dogs in those scriptures refer to the circumcision, the religious and the hypocrites, barking, growling, vicious, and as filthy dogs. Isn't that how they treated Yahushua? Who else don't make it into the kingdom? Who are locked outside the gates? Sorcerers, makers, enchanters, and users of drugs, spirit mediums, black magic, and all forms of witchcraft are included in this new city. And that's religion as well, because they're doing all these things as well. Jesus and all those names, they're all sorcery. Where? Witchcraft are included. You've got in this all music. forms are excluded. excluded. Yeah, it would make more sense, wouldn't it? All forms of witchcraft are excluded in this new city. Yeah, excluded. Three whoremongers, sexually immoral, covering all forms of sexual sins and perversions. Anything sexual of nature that's outside of a marriage bed is perversion and it's sin. That's whoremongers. Murderers. We know what that is. Idolaters, we've covered that a lot now. Liars, those who live in love making a lie. So all those people will not be involved. Will not, they'll be blocked out. They'll be burnt up, won't they? Frackled up when he comes back. So I, Yahushua, have sent my angel to be a witness of all these things and to give my bridal fellowship proof what about this. Give my bridal fellowship proof, proof of truth and authenticity, that I am both the root, which is the origin, the father, and the offspring, the descendant and the son of David. So not only is he David's father, because he's the creator, Yahuwah, he's David's son, because he came from the line of David, remember? Yahushua, in the flesh. So not only is he the root, but the offspring of David, the bright morning star. He wants to give us proof. The whole book of scripture is proof. Yahushua is repeating what he said back in Revelation 1.1. The meaning that as the root of David, Yahushua is identifying himself with the 12 tribes as the offspring. Offspring of David, he is identifying himself with the messianic lineage promised by the prophets. So, he's all those things. The morning star introduces the new day. So Yahushua introduces the new eternal day. His light is in the hearts of the overcomer. Wise men see and follow his star. Lucifer forfeited his place as the day star. That's what he was known as. And he forfeited his place as the day star and the leader of heaven's angelic worship through sin. Now Yahushua has redeemed a new creation to replace Lucifer and the fallen angels. And this new creation will worship Yahushua and the Lamb forever. So now he's going to wrap it up. So the spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone who hears will say, come. All who are thirsty may come and drink the water of life freely. But pay attention, for I'm warning everyone who hears the words of prophecy in this book. If anyone adds anything to them, I will give them the plagues written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, I'll take away that person's share of the tree of life and of the new set-apart city, which are all written about in this book. That points us back to Deuteronomy, where Moses said, Everything I am commanding you today, you are to guard, to do. Do not add to it. Do not subtract from it. <coughs> so, very interesting this. I've had this scripture thrown at me a couple of times. You're not allowed to add anything or take anything away from the scripture. But what's happened to the text of scripture over the last two, three, four thousand years? Has it been pure? Are we still today trying to find out what it actually means? Yes. 
And today we're reliant on his spirit to do that. So we have to live with our own conscience, knowing I heard you who should say that's what that scripture means. Great, until he lets me know something else, that's what it means. That's not adding to the scripture. That's, that's looking at the text going, this book might be written in old Shakespearean and I want to replace it with words that are modern. It's not taking or subtract, adding or subtracting from the book. I don't believe because, as we know, the true message in there is abstract. It's been hidden, concealed. So that, that's that. Yahushua is the one who bears witness of all these truths. And now he says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Yes, come, Master Yahushua. The favour of our Master, Yahushua Messiah, be with all his set-apart chosen forever. So be it. And that's the scripture. Finally, to end this apocalypse, finally, to end this apocalypse, it is reinforced as to why reading this book is so important. Yahushua, who certifies that this entire message is from him, he's promising us, no matter what's happened to the text for the last two, three thousand years, he's promising us that he won't lead us astray. So if we've been in movements where we've been led astray, isn't it him that's brought us out of them? Isn't it him that's refined it over time? Yeah. He promises before he comes back, he'll finish the work. So finally, he says he's the one certifying that this message is from him. We can trust it. He who has previously said that we can count on these words as trustworthy and true, he also says that he is coming soon. So be awake, be aware, and most importantly, be ready. Amen. Come, Master Yahushua. All scripture is Yahushua's book to prove to us that he can do anything. His, his scripture is there to prove to us that he can do anything. It's completely supernatural. So we must believe, trust, seek, find, and get ready. So that's Revelation, guys. It's taken us, thank you, it's taken us six months, and so we're going to do a bit of a summary next week. So we can just, because six months is a long time and we've gone through so much stuff in six months, haven't we? We certainly have. So let's just, uh, we'll wrap it all up next week. Do you want to put the music on, darling? Um, opening up the altar again tonight, guys. This message was really confronting, wasn't it? To see what is acceptable in the city and what's not acceptable in the city. I've been guilty of not believing what everything that's in the book. Have you? Because if you haven't believed it, you're not going to make it. Does your behaviour show that you've made it? Does your behaviour show that you've believed everything in this book? Or is your life a trail wreck of consequences? Consequences of disobedience. Tonight the altar is open, brothers and sisters. Come on out and receive prayer if you'd like it. We will lay hands on you. Thank you, Yahushua. Hallelujah.
Did you not know, haven't you heard? My Creator does not faint. Yahusha knows us so well. Obedient, receive favor. If you've no might, come and get strength. Did you not know, haven't you heard? My Creator does not faint. Yahusha knows us so well. Obedient, receive favor. If you've no mind, come and get strength. Fight it out. Thank you, Yahusha, for gathering with us tonight. We're so grateful and thankful that we can live in this time and understand in retrospect something that none of those prophets understood, even the ones that had met you. We're so grateful and privileged to be living in these last days where we just might live to see you come back and we want to be ready, Yahusha. We don't want anything to hinder us. Please continue to train us. Keep us aware, keep us in love with this supernatural experience and make us, like I said, aware that you are doing everything, everything good and bad to get us our attention and to train us. Give everybody a great week this week. Bless all our families, far and abroad. We love you so much, Yahusha. So be it. So be it. Wonderful. Yahusha comes in us and we are made alive. We get a divine operation. Our old heart and spirit is replaced with new ones. A portal connects us to his throne. A seed of heaven planted, and we must water it. We all love to read his living word. Using correct context and knowing Hebrews 12, we enter the abstract to his reign. In his reign, in his reign, in his reign, three rules catapulting me, finally I see, in his reign, coming to maturity. shadows to behave we can celebrate our redemption as we put the three rules to every thought that comes we are fast tracked to his favored love all the signs are here now the end is drawing near yahusha will come to claim his bride Bright and shining, a loving sacrifice, living stones all fit.